Have you ever seen a sign like this in Nebraska? Say, I, I, I don't want to say there aren't any, so that's why I asked first. I, I find it really strange that, uh, that the, uh, the Winkler's grandfather worked for the Forestry Service and lived in Nebraska. That seems strange to me, because, especially in Lincoln, Nebraska. I, there must be something around that, here that I'm not aware of. But anyhow, in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the mountains of Montana, it's not uncommon to encounter a sign similar to this that will talk about you're entering into a wilderness area and uh, you'll bear responsibility for your own safety. In other words, uh, people aren't uh, on, uh, in place to help you if, should something go wrong. I want to tell you this morning about a place that was very risky like this. And yet, uh, many people would come and, and take this trail, would hike on this, on this trail. One gentleman happened to veer off of the beaten path and ended up falling off the edge of this trail. He was there for two days, uh, survived the evening, and he was hungry and had been calling for help, when all of a sudden he heard footsteps. And he began to call, and sure enough, there was, there was someone else who had traveled that same path and just so happened to be prepared for just such an occasion and lowered a rope down and helped this gentleman uh, up out of his predicament and journeyed with him back to a safe place. And as they're traveling, this rescued man is saying, well, you know, this is just unbelievable that you came by. And uh, is there some way I can repay you? Is there something I can do to show my appreciation to you? And the rescuer just said, well, I'll tell you what. I just try to, to walk these trails periodically because there are people that need rescuing. And how about you participate in that with me? Uh, you, you honor me by taking time to do that yourself. So, and I thought, wow, what a great thing. And so he... He agreed that he would, he would do that. And in the course of time, he traveled and he rescued folks. And before long, there was quite a crowd because everybody that was rescued was asked if they would just continue the rescue process. And so all of a sudden, there are, there are hundreds of people who have been rescued off of this, off of this trail. And then they decided as they, as they encountered one another and as they began to tell their stories and they began to get excited about their whole rescue process. They said, well, why don't we, let's construct a place where we can just all get together. And we can all meet and we can, we can just, you know, talk about what has happened and, and the rescue and the people we've rescued and our own rescue. We can just share that all together. And so they erected this building and, and they would take turns. And they, they, would, they would witness about their own rescue and they would, they would uh, encourage others to the same task. And it wasn't very long, though, before, and you've got the picture by now, before they began to advertise. They began to develop all kinds of programs and say, we're the rescued people. We've been saved from the hill country. And come and see us. Come and hear our testimony. Come and find out what's happened in our life. But the original rescuer who saved the first man, had really asked everybody to just keep going back on the path. That's what he'd asked. We have been talking about what Jesus would teach. I think one of the things that Jesus would remind us of today is he's given us a task. And it's not to build buildings. It's not to develop programs. It's not even to invite lost people to come. He's given us the task of walking the trail. He has rescued us, and we have a story. He has asked us to keep our eyes open, our hearts ready, ourselves available to rescue others. We have talked about a number of things that I think Jesus, were he given opportunity to address modern Christians, that he would teach us to think, to trust, to obey, that he would teach us to serve, to grow. And we spent the last couple of weeks talking about that Jesus would teach us to share. 
a couple of things that we've thus far looked at. The first is many of the misconceptions we have about sharing or about evangelism. The conclusions that we have drawn that have led many folks to just dwell in fear of the whole subject, the word evangelism. We looked last time at the fact that evangelism is really the work of God and that he just asked us to, uh, to, to get out of his way, if you will. He asked us to pray for laborers who are ready to go and harvest the fields that he is ripening. So that's what we covered last time and the fact that we need to be careful not to become a roadblock, if you will, in God's work of evangelism. But we also cannot dismiss ourselves from our responsibility to travel the trail, to rescue the hikers. We must find some way to accept the challenge to rescue those who are perishing. It is in this way that we understand evangelism to be less about what we do and more about who we are. In other words, as people, we need to take evangelism out of this program mentality, out of this home Bible study mindset, and we must bring it into, it's who I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be an evangelist. And in case you're thinking I'm misapplying that word, that is the word in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4 when those that were scattered from the persecution went everywhere preaching, evangelizing. So we all have that responsibility. It is not a hired person's term. As we continue to consider what Jesus would teach about this work of sharing, today I want to look at, um, again, just a single point. And the single point is this, that we need to be available for God to use in his rescue plan. In other words, the primary thing is not about what we do, but it's about who we are. Are we people who are saying, God, I'm going to be available. You use me as you need me to secure your harvest. I am ready. In the scripture reading, we read about Andrew hearing about the Lamb of God who was going to take away the sins of the world, following him home, discussing with him. And what's the first thing the scripture says that he does? He finds his brother and he says, we have found the Messiah. Now, it's interesting to me that when Andrew made himself available, his excitement over discovering who the Messiah was literally changes the history of the world. He finds his brother, and upon Jesus meeting Peter, he changes his name. Jesus knows Andrew has just changed the course of history. And Peter's name change identifies that, that Christ has that knowledge. So we want to talk about availability, and I've got three points about uh, making ourselves available today. And the first one is this. We need to make ourselves usable. We need to make ourselves usable. Now, I want you to look at the graphic that I chose. Because... <laughs> This, this guy is pulling himself back, and you know, once he gets to that point, he doesn't know where in the world he's going. He has just let go. And I thought, you know, that really is, is where you and I need to, to be with God. We need to be at tension with God. He, he is our God. And so we need to be backing up in respect and awe of God. Let that tension exist of making myself available and then when God launches me, I need to be usable. Jeremiah chapter 20. What a great passage about Jeremiah's usability. So the word of the Lord was brought to me and, uh, has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say I will not mention him or speak any more of his name. In other words, if I say I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm just getting persecuted because I'm standing up and speaking for the Lord. I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. What happens? says, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Jeremiah says, it seems like when I speak, I just get in trouble. But if I try to not speak, there's a burning going on. There's something inside of me 
I need to. I need to speak. Acts chapter 4. When they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus, but Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Folks, there's, there's, there's a little key about our usability. Peter didn't say we can't help preaching. He didn't say we can't help going through you know, a five-lesson correspondence course with you. He says we just have to speak what we've seen and heard. What's gone on, what we've witnessed, what we know. Those are the things that we have to speak. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach, Paul says. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul said, I, I, just, I just have to. Now again, Paul is obviously talking about his ministry, which may be in a different, viewed in a different vein. But the commitment, the usability, is nonetheless the fact that is made known there. So, first of all, if we're going to be available for God, we've got to be usable. Number two, we need to be the light of the world. We need to be the light of the world. Jesus will teach early, his first lesson as far as we know. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Light basically has one objective, and that's to dispel darkness. If we were to kill all the lights in here, darkness would prevail. As soon as the lights come back on, light fulfills its responsibility, which is to dispel darkness. Light brings things into view that otherwise are not visible. I will confess to you, the corner of that pew, when I wander in here without lights, almost always catches my knee. Light makes things visible that otherwise would not be. Those that are available for God's use ready themselves for opportunities to shed divine light into people's dark places. Again, that needs to be who we are, not a, a, a given program or an identity of a specific campaign. We are just people who live with the opportunity to, to expel darkness, to shine forth the light of Christ. And so when someone speaks to us and they're in a dark place and their life is in chaos, it's a natural thing. Not for us to say, guess what, you're lost and going to hell. No, it's a natural thing for us to say, oh man, I don't know how I could handle things like that if I didn't have Christ as my light of my life and have a focus on Him. We need to be able to just share those things because that's who we are. That's who we are. Isaiah chapter 54, I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. I was listening to the radio and heard a gentleman reference that a couple weeks ago, and I thought, wow. It never struck me before. God says there are treasures in darkness. You know what one of your treasures that you discovered in darkness was? Somebody became your light. And you never would have seen that light had you not been in darkness. And so God says there, there, there are treasures available in darkness. You and I, if you will, are the treasure of somebody's darkness. That's the challenge for us, to be light. Paul will say to the Philippians that they need to shine as stars in a crooked and depraved generation because, because we've been called out of the world. That's just who we are. It's not a special thing. We're not waiting for the leadership to tell us how we're supposed to evangelize. We are just people who shine as lights in a dark place. So we are usable. We are light. And obviously, you can't talk about light without talking about the other factor that Jesus referenced in that lesson. And that is we're the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. 
I have a preacher friend who years ago at a, at a Montana lectureship was given the, uh, the subject of challenging us in the vein of evangelistic work. And, and I'll never forget, uh, Mick got up, and Mick is one of those guys you never know where he's coming from or where he even started. So he lays out all of his stuff, and he grabs this newspaper. <laughs> And he opens it up. And I, it was a brotherhood paper of some kind, Christian Chronicle or something. And he just starts reading. And he, he starts reading all of these different, different ads. And he says, oh, look here, I can take a cruise with Christians. I, I, can, I, can, go to the, I can go to Russia with Christians. Oh, 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 look, I can buy a used car from a Christian. Boy, I talk about safe place, right? Look, I, I, can, I can live in an environment where nobody around me is an unbeliever. I can live in a Christian home center. Wow. Look, look. I can go to Christian-operated medical centers. I can be treated in a hospital that's operated by Christians, and the people who work there are Christians. Wow. He read all those, closed up the newspaper, put it, put it back, says, just have one question. Where are we supposed to be salt? If all we do is associate with each other, where is our salt influence supposed to happen? Pretty valid point. Salt. Now, I think there's a reason that Jesus uses light and salt. And I think specifically, it addresses some of our hang-ups about evangelism. For example, light is visible, right? Salt, if it's used properly, is pretty much invisible. So here's Jesus saying, some of you want to shine. And you want to expose darkness. And you have personalities and abilities that lead you to be able to be the light of the world. And some of you are salt. And you don't like to be out front. You don't like anybody to know. You work invisibly. Light illuminates. Salt preserves. Salt has to be massaged into light. Light brings sudden illumination. Salt is patient, preserving. You know, God doesn't expect us all in our work of evangelism, He doesn't expect us all to be bright illuminators. He says some of us are quiet preservers. But we still accept the task. We're still usable for the task. So, the whole thing, the whole misconceptions of evangelism that we've held that have led so many to say, well, you know what, that's just not one of my talents. God's just not blessed me with the ability. I can't talk to people. I, I just can't hardly say a word. You know what? God hasn't asked everybody to have the ability of light. Maybe you're salt. Both, however, can be rendered useless if they're made, unless they're made avail available. The light can be hidden, and the salt can become tasteless. When one makes himself available to God, they bear the fruit of availability, which is action. You can't say, God, I'm available, and do nothing. 
It doesn't work that way. The fruit of our availability is action. Our times, just like all times of history, demand that those who have been rescued take action. So if you believe that you are available to God, that you work at making yourself available for God's use, if you believe that in some way you function as light or salt to the people of this world, then the question that naturally grows is, what action, what action is that conviction producing in your life? What is going on in you that says, I believe I am usable for God, I am light, I am salt. There's got to be fruit in action. Some of our misconception about evangelism is that I think, again, we, we, have, we have twisted this all to where even the Great Commission of Jesus, we have turned that into a, a challenge to baptize folks. That's how we view evangelism. In other words, evangelism baptizes people. But do you, know, do you remember what Jesus said his disciples were to do first? They were to go and make disciples. Evangelism is making disciples. When people become disciples, they want to be baptized. And they want to know everything else that the Lord has taught. But we, we have convinced ourselves that evangelism is baptism. If I can't get someone from a lost state through the water and up, I can't evangelize. Really? You can make disciples. You can show what God has done for you. You can be light. You can be salt. We need to understand God asked our, us to be usable, but he also says there's got to be action that demonstrates that. Action is demanded because there has been a decrease in concern for the loss. During the time of Christ, there was a decrease in concern for those that were lost. Jesus was eating at Matthew's house, and he was eating with sinners. And the Pharisees saw this as an opportunity to condemn Jesus. Why are you eating with sinners? And Jesus' response is, it is not the well who need a physician. It is the lost who need the light. It is the lost who need the salt. Jesus said, you guys, you've missed the boat. It's the mercy of God that leads us to being salt and light and influence sinners. But then I think also action is demanded, not just because we've lost sight of what it means for people to be lost, but I think the whole concepts that we have evolved in the church and the programs and worship have diluted the vitality and vigor of the challenge to act. Hebrews chapter 10, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for we who, he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is a garden pack, pack, passage. There's a lot of lettuce in here. Uh, had to see if you were still awake. First of all, he says, let us draw near to God. When we draw near to God, our whole attitude of, of being salt and light and usable, all of that changes. We draw near to God because we bring a sincere heart. 
We bring a full assurance of faith. We come with the reality that we've been cleansed, so we don't have this guilt that we're bearing any longer because God has freed us from that, that we have been washed with pure water. So he says the place this all begins is us getting close to God. And as we get close to God, things begin to happen. Because what happens is then let us hold on unswervingly to our hope. Let us hang on to our hope. Do you know one of the things that will destroy anyone's evangelistic thrust? Is when they lose hope. If you don't have hope, how are you supposed to share what's going on with you? And so Paul says... We need to be folks who draw near to God, and we do that, our hope gets alive and it becomes real. And as our hope gr grows, we profess that hope, and the reason we can profess it is not because of us, it's because of He who's faithful. God's faithful in all of this. He has cleansed us, and so that hope grows. Let us stimulate one another towards love and towards good deeds. Why should we be stimulating each other? Because we've drawn near to God. Because God has done these things. We have this hope, and so we encourage each other. When my hope is down, you encourage me. When your hope is down, I encourage you. We stimulate one another because of that hope we have. Let us not give up our meeting together. Oh man, folks, when you look at the let us in this passage, Coming to church takes on a whole different meaning. It's not about warming a pew. It's not about getting something checked off of your spiritual checklist. It's about coming to a place where you can be encouraged, where you can help others, where you yourself can be stimulated to live in hope again. That's what it's supposed to be about. He also says, let us not give up encouraging one another. Brother John Ellis wrote a book several years ago entitled Clear Choice, Choices for Churches, and he identified some really important elements of our worship time. Uh, and, and again, our worship is supposed to be doing these things for us. It's supposed to be motivating us. Here are some of the things he suggests. There needs to be an acceptable level of excitement. An acceptable level of excitement. Why are we here? Because if you weren't here, you'd be on the edge of that cliff starved to death. That's why. There needs to be an acceptable level of excitement. You know one of the things that our young people wrestle with most? They go to NYC for a month, three months. I don't know how, I don't know how long you guys stay out there. All summer long. And do you know what happens out there? a level of excitement. And then they come back. Now, again, jumping over pews and doing cartwheels, no. But folks, we need to be excited about what's going on. We need to be excited about the opportunity we have to worship our God. He also mentions that we need to have an atmosphere of warmth and friendliness. Obviously, those things are so important if we're going to be the evangelists, the people sharing. And then he talks about growth sounds. Growth sounds. Our assemblies need to have some growth sounds. Some freedoms of expression. I was talking, just to show you folks, we get real particular about this. I was talking with a member uh, just like last week, and we're talking about how there, there are certain songs that motivate us to do certain things. Like, you remember the story about the, the college student who's away at college and hearing that, you know, God is a, is a make-believe and and believing in God is ignorant, and the professor is throwing out all, all, of, all of these things. And, a, and, a, and a, a young gal in the back stands up, and she starts singing, Stand up, stand up for Jesus. And pretty soon, another. Sometimes we will stand up when we sing, Stand up, stand up for Jesus.
But I have never found that when we sing, I stand to praise you, what's the next words? But I fall on my knees. Now I know my knees are there too. It's a lot easier to stand than it is to fall on our knees. But you see, we decide what's going to be our evidenced, evidence and what's not. And I think, I think we maybe need to, to look at some of that. Um, I, lo I love when we sing certain songs and I look over here because that's a growth. It's not a sound unless you've got noisy fingers. That's a growth action. It's a growth action. And I think, I think our assembly time and what we all need to bring into it is, is some things that demonstrate our growth. And if when someone says, let's pray, you want to drop to your knees, drop to your knees. For God to do his work in evangelism, the saved must be available, must be light, we must be salt, and we must be active. Our activity causes us to remember that people are lost and our our love for making ourselves usable infects our, our coming together. This becomes a moment of vital encouragement to us, not just another form of religious service. Jesus, if he were teaching us today, I think he would want us to know you're my evangelist. Walk the trail. You're not going to rescue everybody that falls. You may come upon somebody and not have a rope, but you know somebody that does have a rope. We just need to make ourselves available.